Poe's terror tales have caused many a reader to have a sleepless night. But what terrified Poe the most? What does his nightmares look like? To learn about Poe's greatest fear, let's go back to the source. This is Edgar Allan Poe's boyhood bed. This is where the future poet used to lie at night, dreaming dreams no mortal ever dared to dream before. And this is also where he had some of his greatest nightmares. On those dark nights, when as his childhood friend John Hamilton McKenzie said, Poe would feel the terror of suddenly awakening to imagine a face staring at him through the darkness. It was enough to make Poe pull the covers up over his head so tight he nearly suffocated. Because for some reason, as all kids know, ghosts, goblins, werewolves cannot reach you through the covers. As long as the covers are overhead, you're safe. And it's not much of a stretch to imagine that these nightmares evolved a couple decades later into one of Poe's greatest terror tales, which takes place in a darkened bedroom, at night, in a bed much like this one. The victim, an old man, lying alone in the shadows, hears a slight noise from across the room and sits up in bed, too paralyzed to move, trying to convince himself, oh, that was just the wind in the chimney. Or Poe tells it better, as narrated by that old man's murderer, watching him from outside the room. He was still sitting up in the bed listening, just as I have done, night after night, hearkening to the death watches in the wall. Presently I heard a slight groan. And I knew it was the groan of mortal terror. It was not the groan of pain or of grief. Oh, no. It was the low, stifled sound that arises from the bottom of the soul and overcharged with awe. I knew that sound well. Many a night, just at midnight, when all the world slept, it had welled up from my own bosom, deepening with its dreadful echoes the terrors that distracted me. knew that he'd been lying awake ever since the first slight noise when he had turned in the bed. His fears had been ever since growing upon him. He had been trying to fancy them causeless, but he could not. He had been saying to himself, it is nothing but the wind in the chimney. It is only a mouse crossing the floor, or it is merely a cricket that has made a single chirp. Yes, he had been trying to comfort himself with these suppositions. But he had found all in vain, all in vain, because death in approaching him had stalked with its black shadow before him and enveloped the victim. And it was the mournful influence of the unperceived shadow that caused him to feel, although he neither saw nor heard, to feel the presence of my head within the room. In case you haven't read The Telltale Heart, which you absolutely should, it doesn't go well for that old man. He ends up murdered, chopped into little pieces, and hidden beneath the floorboards.
Now, of course, Poe grew up, and his nightmares evolved. And there's two great nightmares that are recounted to us by some of Poe's acquaintances. They're both set in Philadelphia. Poe is passing through the city in 1849 during the cholera epidemic. Cholera was a horrible way to die. The United States had just seen cholera pretty much for the first time in 1832, when hundreds of thousands of people died or fled the cities. They had no idea about germ theory, no idea what was causing this. They just know when you get it, you have horrible diarrhea, you're dehydrated, you start to turn bluish gray, you shrivel up, you could be dead within a day. What was causing it? Was it coarse living? Was it poverty? Was it the immigrants? They didn't know. They just wanted to escape it. But then, in 1849, it returned with a vengeance. And New York City, with a population of about 300,000, roughly a third of those people fled the city just to escape. So about this time, Poe's passing through Philadelphia, and he said it was like a ghost town. And he came upon his friend John Sartain, who took him in, and Poe was ranting and raving. We don't know what was going on. Poe at different times said that he'd suffered from the cholera. He also said that he was hallucinating because of congestion of the brain brought on by calomel, which is a mercury pill that his doctor prescribed. Another time he said he was arrested for drunkenness but hadn't been drinking. He said it was about Virginia, his dearly departed wife. And according to Sartain, in an article published decades after Poe's death, he said that one of Poe's nightmares or visions or hallucinations was very vivid, that he was forced to drink boiling spirits, and then his tormentors tortured him by taking his mother-in-law, forcing him to watch as they cut her off at the feet, then they cut her off at the knees, then at the waist, gradually cutting her apart piece by piece and forcing him to bear witness. And Poe did write to his mother-in-law saying he had the worst nightmare, he imagined she was dead. So that leans, leads some corroboration to that. Now, also during that time, Poe supposedly had another dream or vision which was recounted about a, a decade after Poe's death by another one of his acquaintances, John Reuben Thompson, the editor of the Southern Literary Messenger in Richmond. He said that Poe told him this story, so this is Thompson quoting Poe, you know, ten years or more after the fact. It's taken from a manuscript of a lecture by Thompson that's in the Poe Museum's collection. I was once in Philadelphia, Poe said. During the prevalence of the cholera there, hundreds were dying every day in the gloomy aspect of things out of doors, the hurrying to and fro of physicians and nurses and the constant passing of funeral processions was in mournful contrast to the intense blue of the sky and the garish sunlight that rested upon the city when darkness came down the long vistas of the gas lamps in the streets, twinkling away into the little points of light into the distance and the bright, steady, peaceful, planetary gleam of the stars overhead seemed to mock the desolation of the heart that reigned around. So Poe says he went up to his apartment overlooking the Schuylkill and I had not lain but a few moments when the door opened and there glided into the room a vision of seraphic beauty. A woman tall and robed in white who noiselessly approached the bedside and taking my hand gently in her own said, follow me. That it was a spiritual visitant I had no doubt and I looked for the wings that must have borne her from another sphere, the whiteness of her garments and her countenance were supernatural. And this 
figure guided Poe out of the room. He continues, I was carried aloft with an incredible swiftness over the city, and a pale object which I saw looming below me and recognized as Gerard College was soon left far behind. On and on we went through interminable depths of darkness, and has appeared to me for weeks and months of time with the same rapidity of motion. At length we stopped, poised in mid-air, looking down I saw by the dots of light sprinkled over the wide space beneath that we were hovering over another great city, a mighty capital or vast emporium of commerce. Now for the first time I became conscious that my earlier vision of seraphic beauty had vanished and that I was born by a bird as dark as the surrounding midnight and as this bird remained suspended and stationary, its wings began to extend themselves in every direction until they formed an immense canopy overshadowing the entire city, a canopy extremely attenuated and admitting of the transmission of light from the myriads of lamps under my feet. Presently there began to distill and fall from all parts of this extended surface big inky drops in a pestilent rain, and it seemed to me that I was myself the black liquid, and that in every drop I underwent the horror of falling from a fearful height, the suffering multiplied a thousandfold. Then the bird turned its beak towards me and cried, I am the cholera. Thence mingling with the terrors of a thousand fallings, there came to my mind the overpowering consciousness of having been made the agent and messenger of death to whole communities of human beings, and the remorse of multitudinous murders seemed reserved for me an everlasting despair. And when at last I found myself with open eyes, I had never closed them, looking around my little apartment from the bed on which I had thrown myself but five minutes before, I could not shake off the conviction that I was the minister of the pestilence that then raged in Philadelphia, and that the depth of every one of its victims would be fastened upon my soul. So that was one of Poe's nightmares. No wonder his tales are still chilling and thrilling readers to this very day. So it looks like Poe's greatest fear wasn't anything supernatural like vampires, ghosts, or zombies. It was the very real fear of losing the ones he loved the most and the absolute terror, guilt, and remorse he felt at the possibility that somehow he had been responsible for all those deaths. Well, thanks for joining us for this week's Curator Script. I look forward to seeing you next week for a little bit more cheerful episode. I seem to have underestimated just how sharp that swinging pendulum blade was. It's an accident I could have easily avoided by learning all about the safety precautions of swinging pendulum blades, as outlined in Poe's classic terror tale, The Pit and the Pendulum, which is now available in this handsomely bound anthology of Poe's works, which you can purchase today at the Poe Museum's online store pomuseum.org slash museum hyphen store.